स्क्रीन का कुछ इश्यू है क्या आप भी ठीक है ओके गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन वी आर स्टार्टिंग द मीटिंग सो ओवर टू डॉक्टर क्रिस्टी फॉर टुडे सेशन गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन as you can see from the slide today our topic is acute glomerular nephritis in children so to deliver the class we have dr georgie matthew is uh, assistant professor uh, in uh, pediatrics in uh, cmc bello georgie please start me so good evening everyone uh, my slide is uh, visible and audible all right i yeah, hope all of you yeah thank you uh, so uh, for the next uh, 30 40 minutes we'll be discussing uh, acute glomerular nephritis in children it's a quite a common topic common clinical scenario occurring with uh, all the pediatricians even though you may not see all the spectrum or all the varieties of glomerular nephritis during your mp pediatrics i am 100% sure that all of you will see uh, some variety or the other most likely a post op cryptococcal glomerular nephritis in children along with other uh, nephrotic syndrome and other uh, variants of the same so moving on so what are we going to learn in today's class so today we have uh, these learning objectives how to identify a patient with acute gl and manage a rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis overall overarching principles of glomerular nephritis along with long term follow up patient with acute glomerular nephritis so we will be moving through uh, uh, this kind of this overview which including the spectrum of uh, glomerular nephritis the pathology of glomerular nephritis the approach and uh, and we will travel through case discussions to on our journey so going on to the acute nephritic syndrome when we think about acute nephritic syndrome what are the things that come to your mind immediately so what is a, how does a patient with acute nephritic syndrome look like so can somebody put in the chat box but you first think of when you first hear the word like nephritic syndrome or like normal nephritis what are the things that you that immediately come to mind okay hematuria hypertension okay so these are the things any anything else okay yeah when you see a patient with uh, acute glomerular nephritis these are definitely the things that come to mind polyuria edema gross hematuria with pola color the smoky urine hypertension and along with that decreased glomerular filtration rate is also quite common in patients with acute glomerular nephritis then uh, while we do examination while we do the evaluation we will find the pathognomonic feature that is active urinary sediment with dysmorphic red cells and rbc cas along with uh, leukocyturia and proteinuria we also find evidence of complement activation in the form of low c3 so how does all this happen uh, in uh, in pathology so in pathology what actually is happening is inflammation or cellular proliferation of the glomeruli and it is not usually caused by direct infection of the glomeruli per se so we will come into the details of uh, each of uh, these scenarios later so first let's have a global overview or a spectrum of glomerular nephritis we know that nephrotic syndrome is a common glomerular disease in children you can see a glomerulus with a focal uh, area of sclerosis and this you know that it is because of podocyte injury and scarring at the other end of the spectrum we have a nephritic feature which has it is mediated by inflammation proliferation glomerular basement membrane breakage and crescent formation so between both these poles we have varying degrees of proteinuria and hematuria we have proteinuric illnesses like minimal change disease and fsgs and our the commonest uh, uh, nephrotic illness that we see is psgn or as it is currently covered under the ambit of infection related glomerular nephritis we have a spectrum of diseases some diseases covers wider areas of both these symptom pathologies that is the ig nephritis or and the ig vasculitis or which is previously known as nocturnal nephropathy and lupus as we know can mimic all these diseases and also can cause both spectrums of the covers both spe- areas of the spectrum we also have other diseases ranging from proteinuric membranous nephropathy to uh, diseases which can cause both these illnesses like mpgn and the vasculitis and anti gm diseases which are relatively rare in children and you may or may not see during your mp uh, training period so how does all these process damage the glomerulus so what starts and how does it go through in the natural history of the disease 
So as you mentioned, it's an immune mediated proliferation or uh, cell infiltration, uh, proliferation or inflammation of the glomerulus. So how does it start? Obviously through the immune events initially. So immune events as we know are carried out by the, the cell mediated immunity that is the B cells and the T cells which are sensitized by the known or unknown antigen which may be self or non-self antigens. And uh, once this immune system is activated, this antigen is presented, antigen antibody complexes are formed and these get deposited in the glomerulus to cause the next event that those are called the glomerular events. So as you can see the glomerular antibody deposits, I know it is a busy slide and uh, small uh, 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 text, but pay close attention to the uh, cursor if you can see. So you can see the glomerular antibody deposits and these cause complement activation either to the classic pathway or the alternative pathway, which are the common uh, pathways involved. As you know, classical pathway causes depletion of both the C3 and C4, alternate pathways predominantly mediated to C3 and not much by C4. But anyway, in the end, membrane, activate, membrane attack complexes are formed and these lead to parenchymal injury. So other player in this parenchymal injury is the inflammatory cells, as you know, the T cells and B cells. Uh, recruit the polymorphonucleosides, macrophages, natural killer cells, all these things and the glomerulus because it's a filtering ground for all this becomes a battleground for all these processes which is going on. So with all this inflammation going on in the glomerulus, the glomerulus gets damaged and what happens functionally that the filtration barrier is damaged and significant inflammation with or without present formation occurs in the glomerulus. And this leads to the downstream effect or even that we see that is causing proteinuria, active urinary sediment. So proteinuria and active urinary sediment are usually seen because of proteinuria and uh, act, uh, along with proteinuria and active urinary sediment, reduction in glomerular filtration occurs because of damage filtration barrier. So this leads to reduction in GFR, leads to fluid overload, fluid accumulation and uh, consequently hypertension and all the symptomatology that we have already previously discussed. So this correlates the pathology as well as the, uh, path of, uh, the symptomatology of, of patients with acute glomerular nephritis. I hope this is clear. If anybody has any doubts, I'd be willing to take. Uh, this is the basic pathophysiology of uh, you know, glomerular damage. I'd be willing to take any questions now in case anybody has. Otherwise, I'll move on to the next slide. So next slide. So how does this immune deposits uh, uh, where and where in the glomerulus are the immune deposits occurring. I urge everybody to mute themselves. Okay, thank you. So as you can see, this is a normal glomerulus at the top, with the orange colored endothelial cell capillary cells with uh, the green colored mesangial cells and also the light blue colored photocytes which are the epithelial cells forming the filtration barrier which is surrounded by these yellow colored uh, moments capsule and we have the urinary or moment space in between that. So if immune complexes are formed in circulation and get deposited at the, in the glomerulus, so where do they get deposited? Uh, logically, they come through the capillaries because they are circulating and then they get deposited under the capillary cell or the endothelial cell. So these are called subendothelial deposits. But suppose antibodies, antibody antigen formation happen within the glomerulus or they are deposited or acting against the uh, uh, glomerular antigen per se or the epithelial antigen per se. Then you will have, in case of the epithelial activation, you have sub-epithelial deposition or which is usually seen in the membranous nephropathy. And if they are directed against the end of the, the, uh, and the, and the low basement membrane, they are deposited in a linear fashion, classically seen in anti-GBM disease. Okay, so once we have this, uh, uh, you know, we know this pathology, so how do we approach a patient to with acute glomerular nephritis? As we all know, the first and foremost uh, uh, layer in your diagnostic approach is a good history and examination. So historically, how do you, what do you want to specifically you ask in the patient with acute glomerular nephritis? You ask for symptom onset and progression. We also look at complications such as hypertension, acute kidney injury. We also ask the patient whether any similar history has happened in the past to differentiate from, you know, a subacute or chronic process from an acute process. We also uh, look at the etiology in the history, that is rash, which are features of, uh, or features of infections, 
features of uh, lupus erythematosus, features of chronic kidney disease, or family history of kidney illnesses. I will come to the importance of all these in the, in the case discussion period. So, after all this, what all do we look at in examination? So, taking all these histories, so along with that, we have all the other history in pediatrics uh, as well as the uh, patient with kidney disease. Along with that, we in the examination, we look for ALR, edema, as you mentioned, lymphadenopathy, wheel skin lesions. So we definitely measure the blood pressure because it's a disease causing hypertension. We look for signs of symptoms of fluid overload. We look at the fundus to look for, you know, hypertensive urgency, papal edema, and also sometimes rarely features of infective endocarditis. We also look for organomegaly and other specific features of rash, arthritis, and the features of infective endocarditis are to be looked on, looked at in any patient with acute glomerular nephritis. So once we have taken a good history, done a good clinical examination, we have some tools towards the uh, uh, etiology. So we uh, go on to laboratory investigations. So these are essential tests, complete blood counts, urea, creatinine, electrolytes, lean functions, albumin and complement activity. Or so complement activity is usually done C3, C4 may not be available in all situations. And sometimes rarely CH50 is also done in many situations. So these are essential investigations should be performed in all patients with suspected glomerular nephritis. Uh, the next essential uh, element in the evaluation is urinalysis. Urine analysis, as some people call it, it's called the liquid biopsy of the kid kidney. You can glean a lot of information from urinalysis. Urine should be always analyzed with the dipstick with the protein and the blood in the dipstick and also look at the pathognomonic features such as dysmorphic red cells or granular cast. For this, an excellent uh, core curriculum is uh, there uh, at the American Journal of Kidney Disease. I urge all of you postgraduates to go through that. You will find a large spectrum of uh, and uh, of uh, uh, good quality images of multiple urinary findings and also the interpretation, how to do the test method methodically as well as how to interpret the test. It is mentioned in this uh, educated core curriculum. So as uh, mentioned here, these are examples of multiple cast, and these, this, uh, the last image are the acanthocytes or dysmorphic red cells in phase one rust microscopy. So uh, once uh, we have done these investigations, how do we look at? So is there uh, what all specific etiologies should be mentioned? So in select patients, we do these investigations: ASO, ADN, we are suspecting BSTN, ANA, and the other evaluation of lupus. We always should do a peripheral smear and LDH to when we are thinking of HUS and the other uh, investigations as mentioned here. Suppose we have some clues towards uh, an etiology while doing a history clinical examination and some of these additional evaluations. But which test discriminate between these uh, etiologies? Then come there comes the role of complement. As I mentioned previously, uh, complement levels can help in differentiation of multiple glomerular nephritis, as I mentioned previously, activation of a classical pathway can lead to low C3 and C4 because of consumption of complement and alternative pathway can lead to low C3 with a normal C4. So, uh, I would like to ask you what all are the examples of classical pathway act complement activation leading to glomerular nephritis. Can anyone tell one or two examples, typical examples? I will repeat the question. Any typical examples of classical complement pathway activation leading to glomerular nephritis, which has low C3 and C4? Okay, PSGN, yes, PSGN do have, does have low C3 and C4. Okay, lupus. Okay, so the lupus is a, the typical answer, which causes both uh, uh, low C3 and C4. So, as you mentioned, low C3, C4, other causes are immune complex mediated MPGN, Glomerular nephritis, endocarditis, shun nephritis. Uh, PSGN also can have also can have both, both of them, but classically it usually has 90%, 70 to 80%. Uh, I mean low C3 and 20 to 40% can have low C4 as well. But C3G or C3 glomerulopathy is a characteristic act, act, alternative pathway disease, which will have low C3s, even single-digit C3s you may find when patients come with C3 glomerulopathy. Which diseases do you think, or which glomerular nephritis, or which diseases with gross hematuria and proteinuria 
can have normal C3, normal C4 for that matter. No complement pathways involved. I am waiting for one or two responses so that I can move on. Okay, IG nephropathy, yes, definitely. Any other disease in childhood? HSP, IGSO, they are, you know, compatriots of the, I mean, the parts of a different spectrum, Alport syndrome, if that's what I mentioned, yes, they can also have protein media and hematuria, even though it's technically uh, good pasture syndrome. Okay, so you have a good uh, grasp of this uh, glomerular disease around how, differentiate, how differentiation is possible based on C3 and C4. So I think all of you will be able to easily answer all the questions today in today's case discussion. Very good. So moving on. So once we have a clue towards uh, what is the types of glomerular, what is the different glomerular nephritis, what is the ultimate uh, gold standard answer for most of the kidney diseases or gold standard diagnostic, that is the renal biopsy. Okay, so how do we, when do we uh, perform renal biopsy in children with acute GN? So I would be giving outline of uh, when to present a general guideline and specific diseases can have specific indications. So these are the general indications. So that is a rapid progressive glomerular nephritis. I have separate slides on RPGN. So we will move on to the pathophysiology and all that later. So in case of systemic manifestation, so some diseases like IG vasculitis, lupus can have systemic manifestation. So they usually require a kidney biopsy. When there is nephrotic syndrome associated with acute GN, we know that it may be a severe disease. It may require biopsy and when there is a diagnostic dilemma or a past history of injury with no acute intervention, you may need to do the biopsy to prove your diagnosis. So once you do a kidney biopsy, there are three tests that we usually send. Most places have facility for two and only some places have facility for the electron microscopy or ultra microscopic examination. So we do light microscopy and immunofluorescence in all centers. So in a patient with acute glomerular nephritis, which do you think is the key towards your diagnosis, whether it's a light microscopy or immunofluorescence or electron microscopy for that matter? I, I will take a few responses. So in a patient with acute GM, okay, I have a one response of immunofluorescence, immunofluorescence, okay. So three responses with immunofluorescence. Yes, as you mentioned, immunofluorescence, even though light microscopy holds, uh, shows uh, various patterns of injury, immunofluorescence holds the key diagnosis in uh, acute glomerular nephritis, which I will come to in detail later. So the various features in light microscopy can vary from mild to severe under the spectrum and also from active or acute lesions to chronic lesions. So from a mild and acute or active lesion, which is usually the mesangial proliferation, which is the mildest of the all, and on the other end of the spectrum, or the most severe or chronic, is the sclerosing, you know, uh, the sclero glomerular sclerosis, that means damage has occurred very early, I mean, uh, quite uh, in the past, and uh, these glomeruli are completely shut off, they don't participate in the filtration barrier and contribute to reduce the GFR, and also hyperfiltration of the other glomeruli. In between these two, we have other patterns of injury, that's a membranous or membrane proliferative pattern, uh, and very in the active end and but the severe end, we have the necrotizing lesions, which are common in uh, antivasculitis, sometimes in lupus. And uh, then we have the most one of the most the clinically severe forms of all, and uh, which are uh, you know very prominent clinically are the crescentic forms of glomerular nephritis. The crescentic glomerular nephritis can vary from cellular variants, which are which show that it the damage is very acute, very recently happened within you know weeks or days. And uh, from there, the fibrous cellular, that means a subacute uh, damage has occurred, and fibrous variants, which is lead to a long, uh, a long, uh, a prolonged uh, uh, an injury which happened in the, uh, quite early. So that means those also are quite similar to the sclerosing glomerular nephritis. Okay, so once we diagnose the patient with. Uh, Acute glomerular nephritis, how do we manage him? So the edema and hypertension are usually managed, uh, usually managed in, uh, with the diuretics. Diuretics, as you know, are very good drugs in acute glomerular nephritis because they solve many problems at once. So diuretics reduce edema, diuretics reduce and hypertension and also manage the food overload. So we have to restrict salt and water and uh, 
the uh, uh, used diuretics and antihypertensives. Amlodipine or calcium channel blockers are one of the commonest drugs which are used. But uh, because we have to avoid ACE inhibition and ARBs in uh, acute kidney injury. In severe AKA, in case of severe AKA, we have to provide renal replacement therapy. Do we require antibiotics for acute glomerular nephritis? Unless there is an active infection or infectious related gain, we don't require antibiotics at the time because I will come in the later slides because post infectious GN or post optococcal GN are usually usually happens in the uh, once the infection is completely settled. So prophylaxis may be useful in the case of epidemics. So uh, prevention of uh, glomerular nephritis. Uh, our antibiotics warranted a cochlear meta-analysis did not show any significant benefit with the, uh, and also this had low certainty evidence. How do we provide immunosuppression in various cases of acute glomerular nephritis? I will come to in the later slides. Is plasma exchange required in acute glomerular nephritis? Currently, there is no role of efficacy. Consider uh, the role of uh, plasma exchange uh, in rapidly progressive or uncommediated so, is it clear? Any specific doubts? Okay, moving on to the next slide. Okay, just a brief primer on the pathology. So, here we are looking at a schematic of the glomerulus. You can see the photo side, the glomerular basement membrane, the capillary endothelium with the endothelial cell, the mesangium with the mesangial cells. So again, in the pathology that you see, so the pathology you can see specifically look at the capillary lumina. You can see multiple open capillary lumina with one or two cells in between, as you can see here. And these cells that you see outside of the capillary lumina are the podocytes. And then the other part of the glomerulus is the Bowman space and the Bowman's capsule, the pink lining over there. And here is the vascular pole of the glomerulus. And also outside, you can see normal proximal tubules with the proximal tubular basement membranes in pink. This is a PAS thing. You can also look at this uh, reference, the uh, one Atlas of Kidney Pathology. It is uh, available for multiple diseases uh, by Dr. Agnes Fogo. It is a very useful resource for all the postgraduates to see the multiple pathological aspects of uh, glomerular nephritis and other kidney injury. So starting from the mildest form, that is mesangial proliferation, as you can see, the number of mesangial cells here have, have increased in blue. So you can see the capillary loops are still open. You can see some capillary loops, but the glomerulus is filled with cells in between the open capillary loops, multiple, any, anything more than four cells in, in between the capillary loops is termed as mesangial hypocellularity. This is usually seen in IgA nephritis or IgA vasculitis or lupus class, class two. So these usually clinically present with hematuria and proteinuria. Another pattern is endocapillary proliferation, which is here at the, at the top, and glomerular necrosis and GBM rupture, which is more at the bottom. This is usually seen in lupus, infection related GN, and GBM disease, and the vasculitis, and they present with acute or chronic nephritis. And the most severe form of these uh, lead to rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. As you can see, you can see that very few capillary loops are open, and these capillary loops are infiltrated by cells as uh, shown by the arrows and also cellular crescents are formed in the later stages where this parietal cell proliferation occurs and then at least a two cell layer thick crescent is formed. Right? Another pattern is a membrane proliferative pattern where the glomerular basement membrane is split and the tram track appearance occurs and also nobular accentuation. This happens in immune mediated diseases as well as complement mediated diseases. They present in the form of visually glomerular nephritis plus a nephrotic syndrome. As you can see, the lobules are significantly accentuated. You can see them separately, which is not the case in the previous uh, normal glomerular line. And also, you can see the thick basement membranes here. Everywhere, it, it looks like you know it is uh, being you know drawn by crayon than a pencil uh, in uh, while you are you know if you remember your pathology type. So these are the uh, uh, thickened basement membranes. Now, this is a membrane proliferative pattern. Just remember that these are all multiple, just uh, uh, disease patterns or injury patterns. Etiology can be varied. Some uh, certain etiologies can cause membranous pattern as well as membrane proliferative pattern, or the other way around. Lupus is a disease which can cause any of these patterns in uh, uh, patients. 
So another pattern is a membranous pattern. As you can see, the glomerular basement membrane has you know significant deposits, and this causes spikes and wave pattern on the uh, uh, on the basement membrane. So primary the etiology is a primary membranous are various antigens are reported, and the list is actually ongoing. There are multiple antigens. I have listed very few antigens here. Secondary is seen in lupus class by B, Hep C, and they usually present with nephrotic syndrome, diana, and epiglomerular nephritis. As you can see, again, these basement membranes are your capillary walls are thickened significantly, and also you, you can see the uh, spike and the pattern in the silver appearance. So these are the histological light microscopy, uh, histological patterns. Now we move on to the immunofluorescent patterns. So immunofluorescence, even though the, uh, so the it's, it's mostly the location and the, the type that is important. And then you can see the whichever immunoglobulins are deposited, that they will all look like uh, quite similar, except the you, you, when you use all the different immunoglobulins and uh, uh, black, uh, light chains, kappa lambda, uh, light chains for immunofluorescence uh, microscopy. So you can see the capillary wall or mesangial pattern and the starry sky appearance. Usually IgG and C3 are the common deposits here. The large subepithelial or garland types are there. Again, IgG and C3, both of with all these diseases which are mentioned. Then the mesangial form, you can see, you cannot see a regular pattern. You can see that it is in between all the capillary loops. That's a mesangial pattern, typically seen in IgA. Then there's a linear pattern along the GBM. Also, you can see a crescent uh, here. So it's in anti GBM disease, IgG, and granular deposits in the membranes. And then sometimes tubular decision deposits are also seen in uh, immunofluorescence. Okay, so now I think we have, uh, I'm not going to any further theory between these ones. So I would like you to look at all these case scenarios. I'll give you a minute or so to look through the scenarios and tell me what are the possible diagnoses. The things that you need to look at are the clinical history, especially the age and sex, and also any other clues from history. So here we have a 12 year old boy with acute glomerular nephritis and headache with, and he has a uh, healed posture and uh, features of fluid overload. So what do you think is the diagnosis here? Okay, PSGN. Okay, somebody has mentioned RPGN. Yes, RPGN is a possibility if you, if you look at the uh, renal functions. Let's see the investigations. So in the investigations, we have we have the normal counts, uh, near normal renal functions. What is striking about the striking about the complements? So you know the normal value of complement C three is ninety to one eighty, and uh, C four is usually ten to forty. And uh, there is hyperkalemia also here. So is there any, uh, does this investigation change your diagnosis? Okay, I am not getting any response. IG nephropathy. And the person who answered the IG nephropathy, can you elaborate why do you think of IG nephropathy? You can unmute yourself. Why are you thinking of IG nephropathy in this case? Okay. So I would like you to go through this. Slide once more, as we discussed earlier, C3 and C4 actually do. Yeah, so this slide again. So C3 and C4 in an IgN nephropathy, usually the complement system is not activated and it is unlikely to be IgN nephropathy in this case because the C3 levels are actually low. Okay, so please. Get, uh, get this uh, understanding or concept uh, quite clearly because it is one of the key elements of understanding uh, the different understanding and differentiating between the varied glomerular nephritis. So, as you mentioned, it is post-reptical glomerular nephritis because we already have a history of a you know a 
uh, skin first you heal skin first you know c3 uh, so this is just an overview of the post abdominal 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 you can read uh, later in this excellent article by dr satoshkar uh, it's a very good article on the epidemiology and pathogenesis also this currently this comes under the ambit of was uh, in infection related gn or irgn which i will come to in the subsequent slides so post abdominal 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 much higher incidence in the developing countries and also with the indigenous communities overcrowding tropical climates uh, it but overall it has been uh, gradually declining over the last decade because of antibiotics better access to healthcare and better hygiene so a typical post streptococcal glomerulonephritis nephritis begins with the post streptococcal infection which has a latent period of 2 to 4 weeks and overall a latent period of 4 to 6 weeks in case of a skin infection or a throat infection the latent period varies and after that a 4 to 6 weeks once the infection has all subsided the immune activity starts and then you see all the clinical manifestations and clinical manifestations edema and hypertension are there almost universally gross hematuria is there in uh, many patients and oliguria is also there in more than half, I mean, around half the patient what happens to these children in the long term abnormal urine analysis may persist hypertension and immune real functions are usually seen in about a percentage of patients with postreptococcal glomerulonephritis so now that we have a diagnosis of postreptococcal glomerulonephritis when do we do the biopsy what are gold standard indication so do the biopsy is performed usually when there is nephrotic syndrome when there is rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis when there is normal complement levels non significant aso titer very young age group extranasal manifestation of recurrent illness biopsy may also be needed in the later during the course of the disease when there is persistent hypertension reduced gfr no complaints even after 3 or uh, 3 months and persistent proteinuria and microscopic hematuria after long of periods of time okay i am not going on to the further details i am given you an overview and this is just to sensitize you to multiple normal uh, nephritis you will pick up all these while you are uh, you know learning in the future okay going to the next case again a 12 year old boy with the following symptoms so what all are your differentials or diagnosis let us consider that this may be the same boy which presented he presented 3 years later in the hospital again patient coughing is persisting and suddenly he develops oliguria and then anuria what is happening here in this situation okay rpgn yes rpgn yes indeed it is rpgn clinically it looks like rpgn because of anuria so does the ex the Investigations give you any further clue? The raised creatinine and raised potassium give you clue that okay, significant reduction in GFR is going on. So it is actually a true medical emergency, which is defined by an acute nephrotic illness with rapid loss of renal function over days to weeks. So because more than fifty percent of the bone lying involved, that's why the rapid loss of renal function has occurred. and it severely correlates to the proportion of glomerulonephritis in presence one uh, study from the uh, midwest consortium had this uh, proportion of glomerulonephritis on 43% suppose more than 43% of glomerulonephritis involved the patients at one year have a poorer outcome when it uh, is less than 43% okay there are two three more studies which uh, show uh, keep a similar proportion you can read those studies later and uh, this request from presentation early initiation of therapy so what is happening actually so this is a normal glomerulus you can see in the first panel on up top and then from there inflammatory cells exude into the bowman space along with plasma protein fibrin and uh, macrophage act activity this causes proliferation of the epithelial layer and fibroblastic proliferation this lead to a cellular or cellular present initially if the damage is not uh, treated immediately this may not revert uh, that it is treated very rapidly and promptly with correct dose of drugs this may be reversible and that is what we see in the cellular crescent it is not treated they may progress on to fibrocellular crescent and a fibrous crescent this image of the uh, pathology pathological image of the crescentic gn is there so just uh, one uh, mention that is usually mispronounced as crescentic gn so it is not crescentic gn it is crescentic gn all right so etiology any glomerulonephritis can lead to rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis i am not dwelling on this slide any longer okay uh, uh, what are the what is the therapy of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis it is very important that you pay close attention to this slide so induction therapy is usually given with methyl prednisone we have to suppress inflammation at any cost very rapidly so maximum 1 gram methyl prednisone or 30 mg per kg is given for 3 days sometimes 5 to 6 days in case of uh, deranged renal functions cyclophosphamide is one of the commonest drugs which are used 
uh, some people, some uh, uh, rituximab is also used in some therapies in case of lab severe disease with previous IV cyclophosphamide use or there are concerns of toxicity. Plasma exchange in the current scenario after the uh, current trials, it may not be indicated except in case of diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and sometimes rarely in ankyloscleritis with RPGN in children. If it's done seven sessions in 14 days is usually uh, what is uh, prescribed. And uh, uh, some centers indicate sepran prophylaxis. So, along with the methyl prednisolone pulse doses, do follow it up with you know prednisolone, usually 1 mg per kg for one month, following, followed by a tapering dose. And after this initial six months, usually patients are checked for remission status and then maintenance therapy is initiated. Maintenance therapy is usually with low dose prednisolone, along with cytotoxic drugs such as acetylcholine, mycopenylate, or cyclosporine. So, you need to Keep this clear in your mind that induction therapy followed by maintenance therapy has to be given because a significant immune activation has occurred if you do not treat it, if you do not identify it properly at the proper time and do not treat it properly, this patient is going, going to go through a lot of trouble in the future. All right, going to the next case. So here, this is a case scenario. Do you have any clues for the diagnosis from the history? Okay, lupus, all right. So, because we have a recurrent fever, some alopecia in the history, in the examination, we can think of lupus. So, this is the investigation. So, investigations, are they conforming to lupus or is there any abnormality that you can find? Okay, specifically, look at the complements. What do they tell? Is it still lupus or anything else? Okay, it is still lupus because of low C3 and C4. There is some anemia, maybe of chronic disease, maybe because of hemolysis and lupus. Okay, but the catch here is the low C3 and C4. Both are low, which lead to a diagnosis of lupus in this child. I'm not going into the details of lupus and its management. We know that childhood lupus is more aggressive. In most of the childhood lupus or lupus nephritis are need to be managed appropriately. I'm not going into the pathogenesis. There are various review articles which you can uh, use for uh, the, the reading. So, usually class 3, class 1, and class 5 require regular suppression, which is along the lines of uh, uh, progressive glomerular nephritis that is includes an induction therapy. It is currently mycophenolate is one of the preferred agents, cyclophosphamide in multiple protocols, along with corticosteroids from the cornerstone of induction therapy. Because lupus carries a significant morbidity and can even lead to mortality in children. Lupus is a disease which you need to treat very, very, very carefully and very, very vigilantly. You do not, you want to, you know, start treatment as soon as the diagnosis is made and also follow up these children very closely. Technically, many of the guidelines, the ULAR guidelines, print of rest guidelines, Hakari guidelines, Japanese guidelines, and a lot of other guidelines, all of them actually ask for the patients to be monitored every monthly even during induction therapy. So that is why the closeness at which you know patients are monitored in lupus because it's such a bad disease. Okay. And maintenance is usually with again mycophenolate or azoran, sometimes given for three to five years. And uh, sometimes even more in uh, patients with lupus. Okay. Any doubts in, in these patients? In, in, in management of lupus? And move on to the next slide. So, along with the, uh, the, the, the immunosuppressive management, protein urea reduction, sun protection, vaccination, and toxicity of all the drugs. Ritika, need to, need Ritika, to be Ritika. Ritika. Uh. Dr. Sneha, please mute. Dr. Sneha, please mute yourself. Okay, moving on. 
So these are the important adjuncts for therapy, which is uh, given in a good diagram in this uh, uh, print of ULAR guidelines, the latest ULAR guidelines. So this is the management of lupus in children. We tar treat to target of first lead eye. That is the SLE disease activity index. You can go through the reference in, in, in your free time. And uh, it is very important that uh, uh, lupus is managed appropriately in children because in the current age of mycophenolate and other drugs, the upcoming drugs are very more than detoxone, but in the current age of mycophenolate, no child with lupus should, you know, uh, die of lupus or have, you know, kidney morbidity or mortality because of the disease per se. So the next we have, so till now we were dealing with adolescent children. Now we have a small child with the following illness. With the history and examination, any clues towards the diagnosis? Okay, HSP as palpable purpura, we don't have, usually don't have other many differentials, but with palpable purpura, you always make sure that it's non-thrombocytopenic because thrombocytopenic diseases like uh, it can, this, a similar situation can play in dengue, malaria, strep typhus, all of it can cause thrombocytopenic purpura. Okay, you see normal uh, hemoglobin, normal platelets, normal renal functions, normal complements and features of glomerulonephritis in the urine examination. So, the diagnosis here is undoubtedly IgA vasculitis. Okay, so moving on to IgA vasculitis in children, it's one of the commonest childhood vasculitis uh, and uh, extra renal manifestations are intersubsidence and arthritis. Renal manifestations usually happen in half of the children and mostly mild, but this is the typical rash which is in pathogenesis. If you are interested, you can read these excellent uh, references. And also, multiple guidelines are available for these. You can use these references to you know go through these guidelines. In the pathology, you, you use the Oxford classification of OMSC, and the management is usually by anticoagulant therapy. There is no role of prophylactic steroids. Suppose patients come with uh, uh, rash and abdominal pain, mild abdominal pain, you don't need to start on steroids. Steroids are indicated for severe abdominal pain. And uh, giving, if you give prophylactic steroids, it does not guarantee that it prevents the formation of, prevents the nephrotectus part. Okay, immunosuppression, there's a lot of debate going on for uh, immunosuppression, but as of now, almost always we use immunosuppression in children with IgA vasculitis. Poor outcome predictors are nephrotic syndrome at onset, no GFR at onset, protein urea, and of all end stage kidney diseases in children, one to two percentage are found by this IG vasculitis. Okay, we have the next case. Okay, I will do the investigations also in this patient. Okay, so I suppose the diagnosis of hemolytic uremic syndrome is clear in this situation. You find there is many functions along with anemia, thrombocytopenia, and no C3. You know that it's a triad of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, and acute kidney injury. I am not going into details of pathogenesis and management. So, main principles in management are prompt plasmapheresis with uh, adequate dose of uh, plasma uh, volume. Renal supportive therapy, immunosuppression for immunocomplement mediated disease, eclismab or ravisorum is the uh, current standard of therapy, which is not available, extremely expensive. Uh, and uh, these are excellent references. Indian guidelines have come very recently. Please read all these uh, uh, guidelines in your uh, spare time to understand these pieces better. Okay. We have another patient. So, what is the important clue in this history in this patient? This patient is also presenting like an acute glomerular nephritis. What's the important clue in this system? Nothing spectacular in the examination. Okay, I'll give you the investigations also. Okay, past history of hematuria. Yes, it's a very important clue. That means we are not just dealing with an acute process, either we are dealing with a recurrent or relapsing disease or a subacute disease, okay, with the complement levels as mentioned here. So, what is the possibility here? Okay, got one response, IgA. Nobody else believes in IgA in this patient.
Okay, so I think most people, I think two, three people, more people have understood that this IG normal complement levels. So uh, the IG, as you know, it's a IG nephropathy in children is usually a, a chronic process. Uh, epidemiology is similar to, to adults and it's higher in Southeast Asian countries. Uh, the pathogenesis, I'm not going into detail, the aberrant glyphosate IgA and all the percentage deposition. The secondary IgA, I'm not going into the details of these. Again, pathology as dioxin classification, let's see, uh, and managing this again and it involves antiproteinuric therapy and immunosuppression. There's a lot of debate on immunosuppression in IgA also, but in children, as of now, universally, we prefer immunosuppression in any form of referred to global nephritis, including IgA. So this is the top and mark of where you can see the blue color. That is the lowest uh, proteinuric patients and the orange color, which has the highest proteinuria. And uh, you can see that proteinuria is a predictor for reduction in NSAID, in EGFR or in the disease in children. Okay. So we have the next case scenario. So what are the particulars in this one? What is the peculiar feature in, in this patient? And what is any etiology can you give with this history and examination? Okay, malaria, GL, hepatitis pneumagaly, yes, malaria, yes. Any other diseases other than malaria? Due to malaria, okay. Malaria can cause various forms of glomerular nephritis. Vacancy infection, okay. Leptospiral infection, okay. Very good. So, all these are valid answers. So, when we look at the examination, any further clues, okay. You have anemia, thrombocytopenia with the deregulating functions, low C3. Okay, most of your answers are correct. So, this is an infection related PN, malaria, streptitis, cell infection, infective endocarditis, malaria. Uh, these can cause this. So, currently it is termed as infection related glomerular nephritis because the terminology is different because PSGN is reducing incidence and other entities are important. And because it's infection related, unlike PSGN, which happens quite four to six weeks or even one to two weeks after the subsidence of infection, infection may be ongoing in these. In this is and then they may require therapy. Etiologies are varied. I'm not going into that. So definitely requires antibiotics, antimalarial scrub type of therapy, doxycycline, etc. I think glomerular nephritis need to be managed as per previous this one. You need to specifically look at avoid or, or reduce nephrotoxin exposure because many of these antibiotics are, and uh, other drugs can also be nephrotoxins. Prolonged exposure, prolonged exposure this stuff may aggravate the acute kidney injury. Usually, unless there is an RPGM kind of scenario, is a no role for immunosuppression and close follow-up is also needed in the future. Okay, we have another patient, a 10-year-old boy, color colored urine for one day, with the family history of kidney transplantation and multiple members. Okay, so these are the investigations. So everybody is able to make out this Alport syndrome. Okay, it is quite a possibility. So this is why, as I already mentioned in the one of the earlier sites that family history of kidney disease is quite important. So Alport syndrome, as you know, is because of mutations in these diseases, varied inheritance, uh, external manifestations of eye and uh, hear abnormalities are there. Genetic testing is very important. Currently, actually, in some some centers, genetic testing has even in a superseded biopsy, electron microscopy is the uh, uh, definitive diagnostic. Protein urea reduction plays a very important role in Alport syndrome and during when selecting candidates, donors for transplantation, inheritance needs to be kept in mind. So, excellent guidelines are available for genetic testing as well as management of Alport syndrome. It is very imperative that ACE inhibition is started uh, and uh, because it delays renal replacement therapy and as to start it as soon as possible. Very interesting finding is that, you know, siblings who have Alport syndrome and the sibling was diagnosed at maybe 10 12 years of age. The sibling was younger sibling, five years or six years was screened. Both of them were started on, you know, ACE inhibition therapy. They can have, you know, as diverge, the lower, lower graph, the early treatment that is actually a sibling study. Uh, the, these are the siblings which had uh, late therapy, the complete lines and the broken lines are, are the siblings who had the earlier therapy. It shows that the renal replacement therapy can be delayed for a quite a long period of time. Okay. Now to the last case, the 10-year-old boy, patient Profinus. 
but as a step for growth and balance. Okay, okay. So this is very important to also look at the growth of children. All these diseases that I mentioned, except maybe severe untreated lupus, which usually have significant manifestations uh, prior to presenting with the normal arthritis. None of these will have an effect on the growth because all of them are acute diseases. These uh, investigations, do they show any features of uh, CKD? Yes, the anemia, the uh, renal functions, and the absolutely normal complement functions. Okay, so this is the uh, manifestation of CKD. You had excellent classes on CKD, so you can manage all these diseases. Preemptive transplant is the safest and most economical modality. Okay, so now we have come to the end of the class for today. We uh, do have a, a brief recap on uh, all these indi in individual diseases followed by the outcomes and uh, follow up, how to follow up these patients. So the outcomes, outcomes are usually many of these in the acute GM a lot. As it is an acute kidney injury per se, most of the pediatric illnesses do have a scope of full recovery that is PSDN, IRDN, IGF, is usually have good recovery. Some of the uh, things can progress on to SLE, uh, chronic kidney diseases like lupus and IG, which are chronic. MGN, member of the also have a proclivity towards going on to chronic disease and the associated vasculitis may be a remitting and relapsing kind of disease, but also has an underlying chronicity. And one of the worst diseases is usually an anti GBM disease, uh, which can have significant reduction very rapidly as well. So, management follow up. You have uh, seen all the CKD presentation yesterday. So, principles are saying one acute kidney injury occurs, we have to always look for CKD reduction in proteinuria, as you can see in both these graphs, reduction in proteinuria and reduction in hypertension uh, will lead to significant delay in uh, attainment of end stage kidney disease. So, all these patients, just because they are recovered completely, PSDN patients, just because they are recovered completely, once discharged, it's not out of sight, out of mind, they need to be followed up very closely maybe monthly in the initial phases and maybe you know two to three monthly later and then maybe six monthly, but do not lose sight of this patient. It is very important uh, to keep these patients in mind so that to pick up early changes of, uh, you know, proteinuria and hypertension and treat them appropriately and we can delay in state kidney diseases. So these are the take home messages for, from the slide, from the presentation. So I'd be happy to take uh, the questions which are already there. If there are any other questions, I'll, Georgie, I'll wait. Uh, yeah. George, it was an interactive session. Hope all you have learned about the PGNs. The first question is from Sukanya. What is the pathogenesis? The pathogenesis of PAGN has classical complement pathway activation. Yet the C4 happens to be normal. What is the reason behind it? Why only C3 is low and the C4 is normal? Georgie. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, even though I'm not a very significant expert in the pathophysiological mechanism, whatever I have understood is that uh, even though immune, uh, all these are immune mediated, usually all the complement pathways do take place in varied kind of form. If you can remember the earlier pathophysiology uh, pathophysiology uh, slide, glomerular with the glomerular complement activation, all the pathways get activated, but to a different extent. Some have only one pathway and some have maybe one or two pathways. But because the predominant pathway is currently established as alternative complement pathway, that is by the C3, but some part of the classical pathway complement is also activated that can cause low C4. I hope that is clear. And if you still have any further doubts, I'm sure I can find references for clarification. Uh, there is one more question. Uh, question is when to suspect anti-vasculitis? Okay, so it's a very uh, important question. Anti-vasculitis uh, is uh, usually a disease which has a long diagnostic odyssey. You know, patient usually goes to multiple different doctors before the diagnosis is usually made unless the presentation is quite drastic. And the, the, the vasculitis, the classical presentation is the pulmonary renal syndrome of uh, the vaginas or uh, GPA. So in a patient who has had history of multiple sinusitis uh, and uh, or uh, uh, 
pulmonary hemorrhage it is quite easy to make out otherwise it is quite difficult uh, to suspect i am sure the, this requires clinical uh, clinical guidance and hence the importance of doing serology in unexplained gm suppose a patient has acute glomerulonephritis aso is normal adn is normal complement levels are normal then we should not hesitate to do the anca levels and currently the guidelines say that elisa should be done anca levels should be done even though they don't have any other manifestations currently if anca is positive with a significant clue then we can proceed towards proceed towards uh, 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 the ct scan of the thorax or ct scan of the paranasal sinus which will show us uh, uh, you know granulomas and even sometimes in the biopsies that we can do by if you do there is a granuloma and it will be possible immune in the inoculum cells so uh, another question that we have is the dose of mycofenolate yes many of the uh, 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 induction doses some guidelines mention 2 to 3 g per meter square some guidelines mention 1.2 g per meter square but the main message is hit lupus hard hit lupus as fast as possible as early as possible as hard as possible give good dose of mycofenolate if you are giving to induction and usually the maintenance dose is also 900 to 1200 per meter square and uh, this uh, depends on uh, basically the uh, remission status okay there are lot of guidelines on lupus to i think you should refer to multiple guidelines and uh, use uh, therapy which is appropriate the upper limit is usually limited by the toxicity levels you look uh, mmf is a very good drug you should use it uh, in case we are not able to use our patient does not want to use cyclophosphamide or rituximab uh, in case of induction therapy of lupus so even though the evidence is not as robust as in uh, adults uh, this one so mmf is a very good drug in induction so another question is difference between rpgn and rprf so any example which is rprf but not a gn so any scenario which does not have so both rpgn and rprf rprf is uh, currently not uh, used uh, uh terminology usually in uh, common commonly in children it is used uh, uh, by certain uh, uh, in some some settings so rapidly progressive renal failure which may or may not have glomerulonephritis so the typical examples is acute interstitial nephritis usually which has uh, usually the urine sediment is bland completely bland while renal functions are completely low while there is rapidly loss in renal function it is not because of a normal level so acute interstitial nephritis is a typical example uh, then hos is also another example where sometimes when they are leaving uh, hos is quite uh, uh, we may not have rbcs in urine but most of the times actually you do have rbcs in the urine in hos but uh, th those two are the usual scenarios any other questions no more questions ji okay. uh, you have addressed all the questions okay so i hope today's session any was more? okay jo ji you can thank you thank you thank you everyone for attending